Uh, okay, so thanks to the organizers for inviting me for this. So, so there are three lectures. So they, they kind of split in the following way. So, so the first one will be uh, Chern Simon's theory for, for, over, for a real group, and I will only do SU2. And so, you know, in this case here, we really know what this means. This is the witten recitigen array of quantum invariants, the so three manifolds, right? And so in two, I will do a new formulation of uh, the Teichmüller TQFT. So this is the stuff I've done with Renat uh, Kashaev. And then uh, three will be finite, sorry, finite dimensional integrals. Uh, and then that will to go towards Chern Simon's theory for complex uh, Lie group, so for SL2C. And so the integrals that we saw this morning in uh, Maxim's talk, they will appear here. And uh, for the quantum Fedeyev uh, dialogue will appear here. So there will be no quantum Fedeyev dialogue today, but if you're here tomorrow, you will see it all over the place. Okay, so let me try to do this uh, Witten recitigen to ray of uh, quantum invariance of three manifolds. And so here there will be three manifolds all over the place. So, uh, so I'm going to choose a link inside S3. This is a framed oriented link. Okay, and so from this I can do surgery and I get M3. This is a closed oriented three manifold. Framed means that it has a trivialization of its normal bundle. Okay, so it's like a little banded link. And now uh, I'm going to pick R, which is going to be um, positive integer. Okay, and then I'm going to look at the following labeling. So I'm just going to introduce a little notation, L, uh, C, LR, this is simply just all the maps from the components of L into the following label set. So I'll explain why I do this in a second. And so I think that in Maxim's talk at the very end, capital N is actually little r here. Okay. And so now, this uh, quantum invariant introduced by Resetikin Tureyev is uh, really very given very explicitly, it's e to the pi i 3 r minus 2 over r sigma of l, I'll tell you what sigma of l is in a second, square root of 2 divided by r, sinh pi over r, all of that to m plus 1, I will tell you what m is in a second also. Sinh, it's sinh, this is like the h. What? Sign. 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 Ah, not sign. Not sinh, but sign. Did I say sinh? Uh, yeah, okay. okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> General request to the writing. I do not understand. What's, what's in the left hand side? Y, R, Tau, I, R. Oh, so this is Tau, R of ML. Tau, yeah. So I use exactly the notation where it's taken to have. Yeah, but I think it was Okay, yeah, well, that's it. the part of this talk is about reminding you of all of that. So this is summing over this label set. This is a finite set, of course. There are finitely many components, m number of them. Here is this label set, 1 up to r minus 1. You take this uh, quantum lambda times the Jones polynomial colored by lambda. So I'll define all of this now. OK, so I move the board a bit up. Yeah, coming on now. So sigma of L is the um, signature. of uh, the linking matrix. So if you just hold all your questions for a few seconds, uh, I'm making a list of the things I didn't define. Uh, okay, so, then we, so this is uh, the signature of the linking matrix. M is the size of pi zero of L, so the number of components of L. And uh, lambda here, well, lambda is really a vector. If I ordered the components, it would be lambda 1 up to lambda m. 
So this is just the product, if you like, when I use this notation over the components of L. Uh, and then I take the quantum integer for that integer. And what is the quantum integer? Well, this is uh, q to the uh, n half minus q to the minus n half divided by q to the n half minus q to the minus n half. And here, if you like, when I'm talking about this, because this here is supposed to be a complex number, right? So then q is e to the 2 pi i over r. So this specific root of unity here. And now jl, or j lambda of l, this is the colored uh, Jones polynomial of l. And actually, this guy here, uh, it lies in C, Q, Q inverse, where we actually can think of Q as a formal parameter, but of course we can insert this value for Q in it if we like. Okay, so this is the, this is the quantum invariance. And of course now I will tell you what the, what the, uh, what the Jones poly, color Jones polynomials are. But first I just want to make a little remark that of course what you can think of here is that you know, you have the boundary two torus of every component. So take the link, remove the link from S3, take the boundary. That boundary is, of course, abstractly a disjoint union of M two tori. And this whole theory here associates a vector space to that, right? So you know what I mean by these m tori? These are just there are m components. And so abstractly, they are just copies of the two torus as the uh, boundary of the link, right? Of the complement of the link. OK, and so the TQFT rule simply says that this here is just the m tensor power of vr. And vr is nothing but the span of lambda running in this set, and then, or say lambda zero, just not to make trouble with the lambda upstairs. So there is a vector space spanned over C uh, of with, with, with a formal basis given by the, these labels. And uh, so, so that's, the, that's the vector space that this thing is really going on in. And then uh, I have some uh, wave function, which is just the sum over these lambdas in one up to r minus one again, and now to the mth power. And this is just the product of the quantum integers. Like this. And then I have lambda one tensor up to lambda m. Okay, so there's a formal vector, or there, sorry, not a formal, there is a vector in this vector space given exactly like this. And uh, you see the, and then there is uh, another vector. So this is kind of a standard vector. And this vector here, that's the complicated vector. So that's, uh, again, r minus 1 to the m. And so this is where you just take the color jones polynomials and you make those the coefficients of another vector. And then this tau m is just the inner product, or some bilinear pairing, in fact, between these two vectors here. OK? And so you should think of this guy here as the, you know, the wave function associated. Yeah? So the question, the spinning is kind of like stupid. Okay, one yeah. or one yeah. Yeah. and you forget about refactor uh, in this form. Yeah, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, prefactor there, okay. Mm -hmm. But essentially, I, I, essentially, it's like this. So maybe the prefactor is the trivial function of R. That, yeah. And so this is the wave function associated to L Lagrangian inside the moduli space of this torus. 
T2 here, right? And so this thing here is nothing but C star to the power 2 divided by plus minus 1 to the mth power. And so this here, this here is the Lagrangian of flat SL2C connections that extends over the complement of L. And so you think of this as the wave function associated to that. And this one here is likewise the wave function associated to, well, this I can't, I mean, I, I just want to make it very explicit. So if I here look at this torus, which is the boundary, so I draw a copy of it. And so here there is a little disk that hits the link in exactly one point. And so I call this curve the meridian. And then if I look at another curve, which is the longitude L, then I have the longitude and the meridian, and they have their holonomies, capital L and capital M, if you like. And then L here is simply just these L comma M's such that L is equal to one. So L and M are coordinates in C star power squared two. And so there is a wave function for that Lagrangian somehow, and there's a wave function for that Lagrangian somehow, and then you are taking the inner product of those two. So that's the kind of TQFT rules. But notice actually that complex connections here surfaces, because I talked about it this way. Of course, inside this, you also have the SU2 moduli space. And that is just U1 squared divided by plus minus one. I mean, divided by plus minus one means you invert both of them simultaneously to the power M. And so this guy here, uh, sits inside here, and of course you can restrict the two Lagrangians, if you like, to these. And in some sense, they're, it's quantization of those two that are these two wave functions, right? So this is a classical surgery picture for Chern Simons theory, but I just wanted to sort of show this picture because it's very reminiscent of what Jan talked about and what Marx talked about. Um, so, okay, that's good. Uh, what do, actually, there's a whole, I mean, to completely make the analogy, maybe I can also say the following, since this was sort of also featuring in the previous talk. And so this is really the AJ conjecture, which is due to, first of all, Gukov, and then also to Garofalidius and uh, Tang Li. And so that says the following, namely that this, yeah, so, so one way I can somehow keep track of all of these Jones polynomials if I want to, I can introduce J series of the link L, simply just assembling all of these. So I sum over all the lambdas, now all the lambdas going into all positive integers, I take these guys here and then I take T to the lambda. So this thing here lies in Q inverse Q, and then power series in T1 up to Tm. Okay. So, it, so I just record all of them like this. And then this, this thing here says that the series uh, of L is Q holonomic. Basically saying that there are recursion relations that these things satisfy and they're, they're partially determined by those. And so I can... Uh, it just, uh, I mean, since it's really close to some of the things that Maxim was saying, so let me just look at Q and E that acts on this set here. And I'm going to do things for a knot because it's just a little faster to do. There's only one variable T. Here there are a variable per the component. And so what does uh, Q do? So Q on such a sum of Q n sorry, of a n of q, t to the n, well, it just multiplies by uh, q to the, so this is an a, it just multiplies by q to the n on the nth guy, and e just multiplies by t. So we, of course, observe that they Q-commute. So it's a little copy of the quantum torus that we have acting on this set here. 
And what it says is that, so, so the, the real statement here is, so, so, so that, that's a theorem. So there's a theorem due to uh, uh, Gaufelidius and Lee. And it says that if you look at the annihilator of the J-series, then that's non-trivial. Okay. And so, uh, well, that, that allows you to actually define, uh, so, so star was defined an A hat, which depends on Q and Q and E. And so this guy here, well, you have to invert E to make this all work out uh, very well. But so I don't really want to get into the details of that, but it actually lies here. And then this guy is exactly constructed in such a way that if you apply, so this depends on the K. And now uh, K is my L. So I'm taking the case where, you know, L is K, where this is a knot. So it won only one component right now I'm formulating this for. And then AK of Q, capital E, Q and E, applied to the J series is zero. And so the, the AJ conjecture, just to state that, which is, which is due to the same people here, to, to Gukov and to Garfalidis and Lee, it says that the following, that if you take AK hat of one comma Q comma E, then this thing here is equal to at the level of the table I'm doing it right now, Q comma E to the minus two. Where, what is this? Well, LK, the Lagrangian corresponding to K, so the flat connections that extends over the knot complement, that's exactly given by the zeros of that A, classical A polynomial. So there is some classical A polynomial associated to a knot, uh, and it's of course in the two monotromies, L and M, around meridian, longitude and meridian, and the zero set of this is exactly Lagrangian for that knot. And so it says that, you know, you can actually recover the AK, right, if you have this. So there is a way to make this unique in a specific way, and then it gives you this conjecturally. This has been tested in a number of cases where we know that this works, but it's still open, this conjecture. But it's very similar to the sort of recursion relations, the Q difference recursions you were talking about. I forget what you call the two variables. Uh, but it doesn't matter right now, but it was it X and Y. Okay, so, so here they're called Q and E. No, uh, so here you're implicitly working with particular choice of framing. Uh, but yeah. That's how it's usually stated, whereas previously it was framed link. Yeah. J was including implicitly the framing factor, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So okay. I, I don't want to get into that detail right now. I mean, I want to just show the principle of things here. Okay. So because I will not really use this part of the story, but I just wanted to show that it links very well with the two stories you've been talking about. Did, did they conjecture something for higher end groups? Just yeah, I think there are versions of this for, for you know, arbitrary, simple, simply connected league groups, something like this. But you see, the, so, so far, the whole story is paralleling very much what we've seen in Jan's talk and Maxim's talk. By the way, of course, I, what I should have said, maybe, maybe I can do this on this board here, namely that this tau r of ml, well, this is supposed to be equal to the integral over SU2 connections modulo SU2 gauge group, and then e to the minus 4 pi squared, and then uh, uh, r minus 2 divided by 2 pi i. Well, uh, maybe I write it like this. H, uh, churn Simons of a divided by h bar dA, where h bar is uh, 2 pi i over r minus 2. So 2 is the dual coxeter number here, and you adjust r down by this, and then you have this. And of course, we don't really know how to make sense of this, but that's the fantastic thing about Chern Simon's theory, because we have an exact formula for what this is by the Resetik and Tureyev formula. Okay, so therefore what's missing now is for me to give you the John Collard Jones polynomials. Then you have the invariant exactly. Okay, so now I will define the Collard Jones polynomials for you. So 
So maybe for now I leave that one. Do they have R minus two or R plus? Where? There? It's R minus two. Because R is the size of the rotor unity, and that is K plus the dual coxeter. Maybe we should move to Pascal square because Chen Simons is defined already up to It's like Chen Simons defined up to one, yeah? Yeah, yeah. This is the definition where Chen Simons is well defined up to one, and then you get exactly this. Result and nature is defined from Pascal square. Yeah. It depends on how you write it down. But okay, so, so the thing is that in order to, to give you uh, the color Jones polynomials, what I have to do is I have to introduce certain vector spaces, and these are really you know representations of the quantum root group at this root of unity, but I will give them totally explicitly for you. So I'm going to take an n that's in this label set, 1 up to r minus uh, 1. And then I will introduce vn. So this vn is not the same as the vr on the other boards that you can't see right now, so it's good. Um, this is a, a representation of the quantum group, right? And so this is span of the following guy explicitly. So this is um, e n, and then minus n twiddle. And so, for this n here, n twiddle is the following. It is just, um, so 2 n twiddle plus 1 is, is n. So it turns out it's a disconvenient way of organizing. It's just, to, you know, minus 1 half. And so then it goes like this. It has a basis like this, all the way up to e n min uh, minus, uh, uh, sorry, uh, n twiddle minus 1, e n and twiddle. So it's a complex vector space like this with this explicit basis. And so of course I introduce the indexing set n, which is just these indices. Plus one up to n twiddle minus minus one, comma n twiddle. Okay. And so then the most important guy in the story is really this following braiding isomorphism. So the braiding isomorphism is just to see. Uh, so the space of dimension n plus one, yeah. Oh, n. N. Yeah, let's do it. Ah, n. Right. n. So this is a morphism. This is an isomorphism from v tensor v, v up n to tensor v up m to the thing in the opposite direction, like this. And so I can write it out, of course, in coefficients. So this is just, uh, I mean, C and M of E and I tensor uh, C, M, J. I can write this as sum over V and W, and then C, V, W, I, J, and then the corresponding thing on this side here, M, uh, V, tensor uh, E, N, W. Right, so I just wrote out a matrix form for this guy. Now I have to give you the matrix coefficients for this guy. And so the matrix coefficients, maybe I put them over here. So that goes to there. So C, N, M. So that's given as follows. So it's something like uh, Q, or not something like, but it's exactly like this. Q to the i minus w, and then it's a n twiddle plus w quantum factorial m twiddle minus v quantum factorial, and then it's a w minus i quantum factorial n twiddle plus i quantum factorial and m twiddle minus j quantum factorial times e to the pi i over 2, and then q plus of i j uh, v w. And this quadratic expression here, q plus of i j v w, 
that is simply 4 i j minus 2 w minus i i minus j minus w minus i squared. Uh, sorry, coefficients are denoted by series for indices, not C and M. I am sorry, so of course, this is i j uh, v w. Thank you. And very importantly, there is also a delta function here that says i plus j is equal to v plus w. Okay. So here it's c and m only. Sorry, this is a typo. Thank you. It's like this. Yeah. And, still, and what that tildes? Tildes, as I remind you, is ah. just a, not to write n minus 1 divided by 2. So, so it is exactly like this. Okay, so this is the crossing, the braiding isomorphism given explicitly in coordinates. And then there is a little requirement, namely the following n twiddle should be greater than equal to w, should be greater than equal to i, should be greater than equal to minus n twiddle, and a similar one for m, n twiddle is greater than or equal to j, we get equal to v, greater than or equal to minus m twiddle. So this has to be satisfied, okay? And so I can just quickly do the other one too. So the inverse can be written in a very similar form. So, I mean, in principle, I can make it an exercise here at the school, find the inverse of this. <laughs> That's a little not straightforward, I think, but, uh, but you can maybe guess it. So, uh, do you want to see it? No. <laughs> okay. So you just ask Jan uh, for the inverse if you can't find it yourself. And so, of course, what's the main idea now? Well, the main idea is that every time I see a positive crossing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have some n and some m, which are the labels of the strands, which were called lambdas before. Okay? And then I have indices on all the edges, i, j, v, w. So I'm going to sum of all edges indices, and then, of course, this guy here gets assigned this C, N, M, yep. I. But that is yeah. a tradition use letter capital R, yeah? No, right, it's, uh, it's composition of R with the permutation. Yeah, I see, yeah. This is. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we'll be very soon in the short of letters. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of heads in the. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the exact guy, okay? Okay, so... And now what I want to do, for reasons that will become clear, is I will actually define a representation of the braid group with this, and then I will close off braids and get links this way. So, we just made a algebraist, it's what, it's uh, some object, so the braided monoidal kekede. Yes, so the whole structure the quantum group gives, so the representation theory of the quantum group at this root of unity is a modular tensor category. That's the language of Turev. And every time you come with a modular tensor category, you can build this TQFT. So is this formula equivalent to like you know, the quantum R matrix of like quantum SL2 or something? Yes, it is, you know. So, yeah. If you take the universal one and apply so the most representations at root of unity, then you get this. Is this one with the Jimbo or...? Isn't it... Uh, mm -hmm. Not it's at roots of unity. It should be a little bit more terrible. So at roots of unity, wasn't it Kirillov and, and Resitikin? Yeah. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to, of course, build the obvious thing. So I'm one, I, I build a little category. Now, so it's not the category you just asked for, Jan, but it's just the, the category where I look at, at you know, the 
the, a groupoid actually. It's the it's a braid groupoid where everything is labeled. So objects in this category is just the finite strings, lambda one up to some lambda m, say. Okay, and these lambda i's, they are of course in my label set. So now I go back to the lambdas. So objects are like this, and morphisms, they are simply just so a hum from lambda 1 up to lambda m, comma lambda sigma of 1, where sigma is a permutation, sigma of m. So it's a hum from the first object to the second object. This is simply just pi inverse of sigma, where pi is the usual map from the braid group Bn, so this is the braid group, on n strands to the permutation group on n letters. So meaning all the braids that send this label set to that label set. Okay, so example, you have uh, lambda 1, you have lambda 2, you have lambda 3, sorry. And you have maybe something like this, and then this one goes down like this, and then here's lambda 3, here's lambda 2, and here's lambda 1, so that's the permutation, just the cycle 1, 2. Okay, so of course this is groupoid, and so now what I want to do is I want to, to define the Jones representation of this groupoid, to the usual category of vector spaces thought of as a groupoid, so I look at vector spaces and I look at isomorphisms between vector spaces. Okay, and so I can actually just tell you exactly, on the, let, let's do this figure here, what am I going to do? Well, so of course what I have to do is uh, this braid here, labeled like this, it sent, gives me uh, uh, an isomorphism from V lambda 1, tensor V lambda 2, tensor V lambda 3, to the one down here. And so what I do is I, you know, there are, there are crossings here, right? So this is actually minus, uh, this here is minus, and this here is uh, minus. They turned out to be all minus. Uh, sorry, that's wrong, this is a plus, of course. So there are two minuses and two pluses. And then what I do now is I label, say this, so what I do is now I, I label all the edges of the diagram that I have. So first of all, I have to label the top one, what I choose here, J1, J2, and J3. Now I further label them by indices of the corresponding representations, right? So I'm going to give you matrix coefficients. And then down here, I have I1, I2, and I3. Okay. And uh, I'm thinking of going upwards uh, in the composition. And so therefore, now I have to label the internal one V1, V2, and V3. And so of course, this one here now, so J, B applied to, of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, applied to the braid B. So if this is B, you just sum of all the internal edges labels. So you sum V1 in I lambda 2, V3, sorry, maybe it's uh, in I lambda 3 and V2 in I lambda 1, I hope it's right, yeah. And then of course C minus, C minus, C minus. You can fill in all the indices yourself, right? And so that's the, that's the morphism on braids. So this gives a very nice, you know, functor between the two categories, very trivial. Although it's not a non-trivial part, of course, is that uh, whoops, you know all that there is, you know, this braid relation, right? So I wrote the left-hand side of one of the braid relations. And so this thing here, you just take the strand behind and you move it across to the other side. And so that actually turns into, you know, the Yang-Baxter equation for these uh, C's here. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So that's uh, that's very nice, very easy and straightforward. 
once you got this combinatorics going, right? I mean, by no means is the expression kind of trivial. You have to have some machinery that allows you to compute this. But that's what quantum groups does for you. And so uh, now the, the Jones polynomial, now J lambda of L. How do I get this? Well, I simply just take a braid presentation of this thing. And then, of course, I have lambda 1 up to lambda m here. And down here, I have the same thing, OK, in this case here. Because what I want to do now is I want to close it up like this. And so every link has a bright presentation like this. And so now, I just give you an explicit formula for what the Jones polynomial colored at lambda is. You just sum uh, j1 up to jn. And you take ji in the lambda i's indexing set. And then you do e to the 2 pi i, j1, uh, sorry, plus up to j uh, n, if there are n ones, divided by r. And then you take the braid, the Jones braid representation of b, and you do j1 up to j n, uh, j1 up to j n. So that's the Jones polynomial. So the nice thing about it when I do a closure of the braid is there's a very simple correction factor on it. And so this here forms a Markov trace on this whole thing. That's what Jones realized. Uh, and so therefore, it gives you a invariant of links. And you probably don't want to comment on framing. No. Everything is blackboard framing. <laughs> OK. So that, that's what I avoid by sort of doing it this way here. OK. Super. So uh, let me uh, just give you an example, OK, so that you, uh, you have something to think about and look at. So example, that will be a running example. Uh, k is going to be equal to 4, 1. And so let me draw 4, 1 for you. So 4, 1 is this knot here. Uh, yeah. Just want to make it completely clear that it's the figure eight knot. That's the figure eight knot, right? Can't really argue with that. <laughs> so um, actually, Tang Li was the first to actually really compute a very nice formula for the color Jones point for this guy. Of course, what you can do is you can just, you know, there is a braid presentation of this guy. I, I don't think I have it right. Yeah, well, OK. So if you want. This is also the following guy, sigma 1, sigma 2, inverse, squared closure, where sigma 1 braids strand 1 and 2, and sigma 2 braids strand 2 and 3. So it's a closure of a 3 braid. And you just take this word, sigma 1, sigma 2, inverse, and squared, and that you close it. That's the same as this link. So then you just stick it through here, and you will get a formula for it. And if you're very nifty with these kind of things, you can reduce it to the following expression. Um, so, uh, j, j lambda of k, this is a quantum lambda, and then m equals 0 to lambda minus 1, and then q to the m lambda, and then q to the lambda plus 1 comma q m, and then q to the uh, lambda minus 1 comma q m. So these are the Pockhammer symbols, the standard Pockhammer symbols, finite ones of order m. Uh, can you define them just for those? Who yeah, 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 yeah. So a q is product uh, m is uh, l equals 0 to m minus 1, 1 minus a times 1 minus a q and sorry I mean sorry <laughs> uh, let me write it like the q to the l a so it's this one explicitly okay so uh, 
you know, I can write it out also very explicitly because I think it's a li nice little formula. Uh, well, this is trivial, but nevertheless, sine lambda pi over r divided by sine pi over r, summing m equals zero to lambda minus one, and then e to the minus two pi i m lambda over r, and then this product, L equals one to m. I like to write it this way, one minus e to the two pi i lambda minus L times uh, one minus e to the two pi i lambda plus L, like that. So that's the very explicit guy. Uh, did you define quantum lambda before? It was used in our matrix, but I don't know if you gave a definition. Maybe you did, yeah. Quantum lambda I defined very beginning. The one thing I didn't define was quantum lambda factorial, but I think everybody got that without complaints. So, um, and of course, you could, I could say the same thing about the TQT vector space here, right? So one dimensional torus, and there is a, there's one thing I think I do want to say. Just by, by giving you just at least one example of all the things I've talked about, let me just give you the A, A polynomial of this guy. So if you know you do the same things as I talked about before, you have these two wave functions that corresponds to the Lagrangians and blah, 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 blah. I don't want to write all of that again, but if I look at LK, then this is actually the following. This is just A, K, of Lm equals to zero and Ak of Lm. This guy is L minus one times minus L plus Lm squared plus M to the four plus two Lm to the four plus Lm squared M to the four plus Lm to the six minus Lm to the eight. So that guy. Okay, so that's the Lagrangian we're quantizing and somehow we are getting this wave function out of it. So the beautiful thing about John Simon's theory is that it gives you explicit formula for all these wave functions. So there's no, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean ambiguity in any things here, it's, it's, it's really nice. Um, yeah. yeah, so is it John's polynomial should be polynomial and you not, and, and you write sign, yeah, it's not really. You should be variable, not not the specific. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wrote it in radius. First, I wrote ah, it in that form, and then afterward, I wrote it down. It's because ah, I, I'm, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. I, I wrote it down. All right, I, I just want to uh, do uh, one more thing. Namely, so so far, I have just told you about surgery on framed links, but I can also do rational surgery, and so I just want to give you a stack of three manifolds and their corresponding quantum invariants. So, um, where am I? So, yeah, so, so in, there is, of course, a quantum representation. Representation, namely, look at the mapping class group of the two torus. Well, that is L SL2C matrices, right? Just mapping the torus to itself. And so this guy here goes into U R minus one. So unitary R by R, R minus one by R by one matrices. And uh, if I now define Psi zero as the one that is one inside this vector space, VR T2. So maybe I should just recall for you that this is span uh, of uh, lambda in one up to R minus one. And then it's like this. And so I just take the first vector like this. Okay. then. Uh, sorry, that is right. There was a little thing missing there. And so if I define Psi A over B to be row R of the matrix A, B, C, D applied to this vector Psi C here, then I get a vector, uh, you know, a new vector in this vector space. And the thing is that if I want the quantum invariant of the manifold, which is obtained by, you know, uh, let me take a knot, by doing A over B surgery on this guy. Well, then that is simply Psi for the knot, and then you take the pairing with 
A over B. So that's the way it works uh, with this T of T rules. And I can actually write down uh, this row R of A, B, C, D explicitly for you. And so now I do this because you will see that that gives you some of the quadratic terms in the formula tomorrow that Maxime was talking about. So um, this guy here explicitly is, well, some factor, prefactor that depends on R, which I don't want to do. Then sum over mu is equal to plus or minus one. I write it this way, sum over n equals to zero up to the size of b minus one, mu and then exp of a long expression, not too bad, but it's like this, 2b r a j squared minus two mu j, k plus two r n uh, mu plus d k plus two r n mu squared like this. So there is a like that and there is a one like that. So there is an explicit expression for this representation like that. Okay? It's a unitary representation so that's why the CR is there to make sure that all operators are unitary and it's really a representation. And then you see that you just get this very simple formula for this guy here by combining these. Right? Okay, so uh, what time is it? Yeah, good, good. So what I want to do now is I want to formulate so the, uh, the main conjectures in this field about all of these invariants as I see it. Okay. Story, there was no victim, yeah? there, there was in the W, in the WRT, and yeah. there was this formula here, right? Uh, yeah, but uh, it was absolutely clear that uh, Resitikin and Turev took ideas from Witten's paper on this to write down what they had. If you doubt about that, ask Kulin. Yeah, I know. Kulin told me. I doubt because you know the real so, uh, so now I want to make a couple of conjectures. So the first one is due to Witten. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so one, and that's Witten, if you like. But in some sense, it is just what you would expect if you look at a path integral like this. Okay. So what we expect is that tau r of some closed three manifold m, maybe I write ml, since we've been doing this all the time, is, has an asymptotic expansion as r goes to infinity, which is of the following type. You sum through the finite set of SU2 transimens values. Then you take exp of minus four pi squared divided by two pi over r minus two. And then r to the d theta, I'll say that what that is in a second, uh, b theta, and then one plus, and then set theta of two pi i over r minus two. I think you lost theta in the exponent. Maybe first it's on theta. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so there should be a, a, a theta here. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, and so uh, this guy here, set theta of h bar. Well, that's a formal series. It's most likely divergent in most cases. Some cases it's not, but some it's r. And uh, all the examples we know, this exponent is inside half integers, as far as I know. And b theta is a real number. So there is an asymptotic expansion in the Poincaré sense, meaning that you truncate all these series at some large n, take that finite sum and take it on the other side, take the absolute value, and then that grows like one power less in R. 
in yeah in r minus two, as as r as r goes to infinity. Strange, a small number of jumps here. Yeah. Well, um, mm. I have a quick question. So yeah, uh, here you sum over values of transcendent or flat connections, uh, com connected components of flat connections. In other words. Can there be two mm. flat connections with the same value of transcendence and they're in by different values of dt or other things, for example? Yeah, they could possibly be, but then they just come in the same thing here, because it's just that you take the maximum of the d thetas for that, and then you cl clump it all together. So the whole idea is that, you see, when you write it this way, the set here is determined by the right-hand side, and the d theta is determined, and the b theta is determined. So it's not the normal sum over flat connections, which actually don't make sense in general, right? Because, well, this said, uh, <laughs> yeah. but here we've summed away that and just take the sums of the, th of the trans values. Fischer, a bit Fischer, yeah. Fischer, yeah. I think it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's nothing fishy about this. It's completely true. Uh, what do you mean? Completely true. Conjecture? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Since we have each complicated mm. varieties and we get not, not yeah. isolated and not isolated mm. guy and yeah. who knows. Okay, so, so I mean, what could happen, okay, is that you have arithmetic progressions on these instead. And finally, many arithmetic progressions. Many logarithms. Logarithms. Right, right. Yeah. And then maybe logarithms. It's just we don't so know. Center, center. But add yeah. them if you like. And, and then real numbers also don't believe it. It could be cancelled, yes. It's it's, it could be very, very seldom. It could, you have just one per million, but we can go to where But I mean, we do see these real numbers here. These are, these are randomized distortion, or square root or randomized distortion, right? Yeah, no, no. Those we see. No, no, but they, they can cancel, okay? Yeah. No, 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 no. There are examples where they don't cancel. For ciphered fiber manifolds, we know they occur. No, no, of course, yeah, but yes. in principle, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so then there's, uh, sorry, uh, Kashayev, uh, volume conjecture. So it says the following, when you take the limit as r goes to infinity of 1 over r and then log of, you take j, you take j, r. So notice that r is not a loud label, right? It's just one outside, so it has quantum dimension zero. But what you do is you do this, and then you divide by the guy for the unknot, in the way I have normalized things over r, and you, so you evaluated the same root of unity as the label, then this here is conjecturally is equal to 2 pi, 1 over 2 pi times the volume of S3 minus K. So again, what is JR of U? Unknot. Uh, unknot, U is the unknot, sorry. Yeah, U is the unknot. Okay. And you probably mean log of absolute value. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Like that. Okay, so that's the volume conjecture. It's been tested in many, many different cases. Uh, and then let me just uh, do one more conjecture, uh, which are kind of things that I would like to have set up um, before I write the main resurgence conjecture and then I'll stop. So, these are the GPPB invariants, Gukov, uh, Pei, Protrov, and Wafa invariants, which I think also took its origin in some work of Gukov and Mourinho, and the third guy was Putrov, I think. And so these are set head invariants labeled by spin C structures of ML. And so, Sergey, please allow me to say that they are normalized, so they lie in here for now. And so A is a spin, a is a spin C structure of ML. So they're indexed by spin C structures. So, what is ML? ML is the manifold we obtained by doing surgery on L. Ah, it's L is yeah. yeah. And so this guy here is supposed to be the sum 
where we sum over i and j, and then minus 1 to the i, q to the j, and then the dimension of h i j of m l comma a. So there's supposed to be some vector spaces or modules, and so this h i j in the sort of physics way of talking about this, these are the vector spaces of uh, B P S states. And so, but these are sort of Kovanov type homologies one would like to construct. This is a J, supposed to be down here. So they're not really constructed yet mathematically, as far as I know. And here's ML as well. But uh, these series here can be actually be constructed, some specific examples, okay? All right. So with the arm with this sort of uh, conjectures here, I want to formulate another conjecture, which uh, is, yeah, let me leave the example up there, and I hope I can fit it on these, these boards here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what I would, uh, actually I want to put it in the main middle here, so let me put this up all the way up. <laughs> oh. yeah. So it's what I would like to call sort of the, the resurgence conjecture. So it, it, it doesn't really need exactly those conjectures in some sense independent of it, but in the formulation I give it now, it, it will depend at least on witness asymptotic expansion conjecture. But so the resurgence conjecture. And so there are lots of, of names attached to this. Suddenly Stavros should go there, Markus should go there, Gukov should go there. Uh, Putrov and so on, number of people. So, um, but le let me just write it out. So, it one, these series here, are resurgent. So the series from up there, from the Witten's asymptotic expansion conjecture, are resurgent. Um, we can, two, Borel, uh, do the Borel sum of these. Whoops. Uh, can't really bend in this leg. <laughs> um, and so these guys here are defined uh, on the complement and of some discrete set. And which set do we expect it to be? Well, we expect that if you take minus 2 pi i in the normalization I have of churn Simon, so the complex churn Simon values, then this is, this is exactly the set modulo set. I mean, it's, it's shifted by theta, isn't it? So, sorry, what? So you shifted by theta, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, it should be shifted by theta. This guy here is shifted by theta. Okay, um, then uh, three, of course these B thetas satisfy a wall crossing structure, maybe analytic, okay, and uh, if we take, so, so four, suppose I take theta C, this stands for the conjugate the, uh, theta value, so the conjugate Chern Simons value. So this is uh, Chern Simons of conjugate representation. So think about the manifold is hyperbolic, it has a hyperbolic representation, the conjugate of that is another representation, and so it has a Chern Simons value, that's the one I'm calling theta c. Then that guy is, if I take the Laplace transform of b 
theta c, well, this is supposed to give the z a k, the Teichmuller t q of t. Okay. Laplace transform. And, um, you know, the, finally five, sorry, this is kind of a little funny order here, but, you know, somehow the set had a g p p v invariant is obtained by a finite Fourier transform uh, of the B thetas. Let me put it a little vaguely like this. But so these set A hat should be determined by these Bs as well, these B thetas. Yeah, yeah, with faces and stuff like this, like Sergei. So in number four, you mean specific theta or some theta, some set of thetas? The, the four? I mean only the value that corresponds to the conjugate representation. So I take B theta corresponding, I take B corresponding to the conjugate representation. And then I do Laplace transform of that guy. That should give you... So I would conjugate for what theta? And, or for it's what? conjugate for the hyperbolic one. Oh, I see. Yeah. So you take the hyperbolic one and you conjugate it. And then that has a Chern Simons value. Its imaginary part is the smallest possible there are among all the complex Chern Simons. And you have foil defined ray going down, Stokes, and so that's the one we found with, with Renat. And so th this is the sort of general resurgence conjecture. Uh, so, uh, and what I will try to do tomorrow is then to show you the new formulation of this guy here. So to actually give you at least one of the Bs via the, this inverse Laplace transform. And then I will talk about, in the second lecture tomorrow, I'll talk about finite integrals, which gives you exactly the, the real transimants. And then I will look at other Lefschetz symbols and give you, in particular, this one from there, in particular in this example. And the other ones will be other Lefschetz symbols. So, all right. Thank you. Is it possible to say what you mean by resurgence in one? Yeah, it means that, uh, you know, when you do the Borel transform to this, then that's convergent in the small disk, and it is endlessly and analytically continuable in the complement of some discrete set, and the set is in that set, as William pointed out, shifted by theta. So just minus theta. So two is just a refinement of one, then. Yeah, it tells you where the singularities are. That's right. And then the B thetas satisfies the wall crossing system. That would be an analytic wall crossing system. There will be a further information. And then the question would be how unique are they if given that system? I don't quite know. And then finally, there is a way that we actually know one of them already explicitly by, by my work with Renat. So we have a formula for that guy that corresponds to the conjugate representation. But this, this uh, last statement, we know that it's not always true. I mean, it depends on the direction, on the, on, on the value of h bar. I mean, you know, you yeah, no, that's right. This is, this is for very specific. If you start moving in the complex plane, there will be corrections to yeah. this formula. It's in some specific direction that that works. I agree with that. I agree. Yeah. So if I remember right, these uh, z hat a's are supposed to have some kind of uh, nice asymptotics when it goes to a uh, root of unity, where there's some kind of expected behavior. Oh, well, that's what it says up here. Right. Uh, oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, I said that the radial limit conjecture. Yeah. Uh, do you see yeah. something? Yeah. And it's something? true in some cases, but. I'm not sure whether it's true always. Mm. I think we'll talk about that later today, though. We'll talk about that later today. Yeah, we we'll don't talk about it, and, and I think we we'll we'll has about some. You can see it on the B thetas. Wheeler has some examples where it doesn't work, as far as I understand from him. But that's not. That's what he says to me. So I didn't put it there. All right.
Second, maybe. I know you don't like training, but then maybe this is detailed. But uh, it's a more of a comment. Uh, for example, uh, for two, uh, somebody should look at zero surgery on five two knot because there the set appears to be a little bit shifted. So it's set of Stern Simons values where we see the poles, but I cannot explain the shift. And, uh, I hope that somebody smarter can can, can explain the shift. So zero surgery on five two. Five two. Yeah. That's the first simplest example where mm -hmm. again it looks like it fails, but probably they're missing something. I'm sure in the end that will be true in, in better understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are no more questions. No, no, just ah, one in my story, I have just symmetric matches with rational coefficients. Yes. And you have no something from the imagination. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's a joke. But you insist that there is no chance. Yeah, yeah just no symmetric no matches with so rational coefficients. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, I mean, the, the p sure, right? I mean, yeah. you know, if you. Th this is very reminiscent of the Neumann Segear data, right? Yeah. And the Neumann Segear data determines the triangulated three manifold. And so some of them are three manifolds, yes, others are not, and that's why I said maybe the example, the baby example you looked at is maybe not a three manifold. I don't know. I don't think it's a closed no, three manifold. So actually, we know it's not a closed three manifold because of its asymptotics. Okay, because it should have gone like uh, it, it went exponentially fast, but it should have, uh, <laughs> but it's it, it's really doesn't for, from the for the trivial flat connection, right? So, uh, so yeah, I mean, of course, you can map three manifolds to such matrices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. And then you can study the general one. It's fine. <coughs> I mean, I don't see any problem with that. Some people like three manifolds, right? By the way, it could be fun to formulate. What's the volume yeah. of these yeah. matrices? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks again. Thank